Good to go, Richard. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining us and welcome to this virtual wine tasting from Villa Maria and the New Zealand Chamber. My name's Rachel Boyle. I'm the Executive Director at the New Zealand Chamber in Singapore. Villa Maria is one of our silver sponsors and we're really grateful for their support today and throughout the year. I have my cellar selection wines standing by and I'm really looking forward to tasting them and learning a wee bit more this evening. Now our experts here today are Matt Della, he's a Master of Wine and Villa Maria's Chief Global Sales and Marketing Officer and Angela Lewis, um, Villa Maria's Global Brand Ambassador. And in the background, we have Michelle Lamb, Villa Maria Export Market Manager, who looks after Singapore. A wee bit of housekeeping just before we kick off. If you've got any questions during the session, there is a green Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Type your question here and we'll save all, all the questions until the end. There's also a button at the bottom of your screen which says poll. Now, everyone who responds to the two questions on our poll this evening um, and get it correct, go into the draw to win a bottle of Villa Maria Reserve Sauvignon Blanc. Um, now, there will be a couple of times this evening when we do share everyone's faces. So if you don't want to be seen by everyone, just make sure you turn your video off. Um, but that's, that's all from me. So now I'll hand over to Angela to get things started. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, it's actually nine o'clock here, but we know it's perfect drinks time with you guys, five o'clock. Um, and we're really so excited to be here. So um, we've found, we think it's a perfect time for you just to start, for those of you who've got the wine, and quite a few of you have, to start that, uh, get that Sauvignon Blanc open. Um, it's amazing to think we're talking to you in Singapore. I think we've learned a lot in the last few months, but um, we want to thank you again for joining us. But also, um, we hear that you've gone back into lockdown again, which is perhaps not so good. We're sort of slightly easing out of it. So um, one of the big features in New Zealand has been talking about being in your bubble. And I don't know if that's been the same in Singapore. I've probably, you've probably heard about it. Um, it's really quite a common conversation to say to anybody now, quite openly, who are you sharing your bubble with? So that's, um, that's quite, a, quite a, I think it'll be the thing I remember most about this experience. Um, while I've worked for Villa Maria for years, um, I've, this is the first Zoom tasting I've done, but I'm very lucky to have with me um, Matt, who's um, very experienced. So um, I'm going to, hopefully he will help guide me through this evening. So um, let's get started. Let's get that first uh, glass of wine poured and um, take it from there. So I'm just going to get mine poured. Lovely and cold. That's the great thing about Sauvignon Blanc. It's a wine that loves being well chilled because it's got so much flavour. It bursts through. So, Matt. Yes, um, wonderful to uh, see all of you and welcome. Um, and and as Angela said, it's it's amazing, isn't it, that we're uh, we can do this tasting here from from New Zealand um, here in Auckland, and um, and you guys are, are there in Singapore, and yet we're all we're all together, we're all in the same bubble tonight, aren't we? <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> so I've. Um, I, as um, Rachel mentioned, uh, I, I am a Master of Wine, um, which is a, a, a um, qualification that I earned while I was living in the United States uh, for seven years. And I recently came back in January uh, to join the Villa Maria family. But um, having worked in, in the global wine industry for 25 years, starting in New Zealand. Um, I've been a long time admirer of Villa Maria and, um, and I've known Angela for a long time, back uh, in the sort of late 90s when I was um, organizing the St. Helier's Wine and Food Festival and, and mm. uh, Angela was, was uh, in charge of the, the Villa, Maria, Villa Maria Marquis. Um, so, but, uh, but long before then, and, and back when I was in elementary school, uh, Angela joined Villa Maria back in 1984. <laughs> um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Angela? 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm glad to. Of course, I was terribly young when I started, Matt. You've got to remember that. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I was just going to say there's over 50 of you with us tonight. So it is a very big bubble. It's probably, probably what, not legal, to be honest, but that's okay. Um, yes, I joined Villa Maria in 1984. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the founder of Villa Maria. It was founded by a man called George Fistovic. He was, um, his, both his parents were Croatian immigrants. They actually came to New Zealand and met. And um, he was the second son in the family. So they bought some land, uh, which most Croatians' families did. They were very keen on coming to a country and establishing themselves. And the, he lived out at Mangaree near the Auckland airport. Because he was the second son, he was um, asked to become a, to learn a trade. So he um, took up the tools and he was to become a builder. His older brother, the oldest son in the family, and those families went to university. And so his oldest brother became a, a lawyer. So George at 15 left school and he was doing his apprenticeship, which took five years in those days. And, um, but while he was doing it in the weekends, he used to do a bit of trading. I, I used to sell motorbikes to make a little bit of money and things like that. He used to go out to another part of Auckland called West Auckland, where there were many, many Croatian families, names like Babic, Brakovic, Delegates. He would go out there and he made friends with um, everybody out there and um, he got a taste for winemaking. So when he finished, um, when he finished his apprenticeship, and he assures me he finished it and he got a certificate. He approached his father and he said, could I lease the land around our house um, to grow grapes? So basically he was 21 when he formed Villa Maria and um, where he set up that first, where the first grapes were grown was where the winery was that I, when I first joined Villa Maria. So that was <clears throat> 1961. So it's, pretty exciting with nearly been going for um, 60 years so um, that's the that's sort of what um, what has come out of his time of course he's in his 80s now so we always talk about one man 57 years we need to update our PowerPoint when we talk about 10 brands we're actually talking about the fact that George had Villa Maria but along the way he like purchased some small boutique wineries so that's where the other brands come in and within, we now we export to 60 plus countries in the world. And one of the other big things that we do as a company, we're very passionate about uh, entering wine competitions. Um, so we have actually over 2000 awards. So we're New Zealand's largest, biggest um, award winner. And just getting back to the fact that when George started, how, how would it be back in 1961 in New Zealand? Not a lot of people knew about wine. So when we talk about the awards, one of the key factors of that was when he first started making wine, I think his first vintage was about 1962 or three, he actually put it in shows. It wasn't so much to win the medals, it was more to get feedback. How am I going? What am I doing? But that's become the mantra of our company and all our viticulturists and winemakers are constantly trying to improve to make the very, very best possible wine. And they're very good at being counted for and they'll go and put their wines in. You don't always know if you're going to get a gold medal. It's, you know, you're putting, your, you're putting yourself on the line. And that's been um, a mantra of our company. Um, so it's kind of with his force, you know, relentless um, passion for producing wines. And, and then actually on that, we've been uh, voted the New Zealand's, uh, the world, in the top 10 world most admired wine brands. Um, all sorts of accolades like that. And I think, Matt, you'll really relate to this um, and help what value that gives a company to achieve these results. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and it's interesting talking to the, to the viticulturists and winemakers today. Um, you know, Villa Maria is, is, the, is New Zealand's most uh, awarded wine company, but, um, but it, we're not actually get going out to win awards. Um, it's lovely that we get them, and um, it does it does help um, give people confidence in 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 Villa Maria as a as a winery uh, and as as New Zealand's best winery. Um, but the reason why um, the, the the reason why we even enter our wines and for awards is is really to benchmark ourselves isn't it and and to make mm. sure that we're we're maintaining that standard um because every year it gets harder to win these 
these trophies and, yeah. and 95 point scores and things. Um, the the, the, the w wines of the world are getting better every year and we need, so we need to get better every year. So we're just constantly benchmarking ourselves and making sure that we're at, at that, you know, great world-class standard. Um, I remember the first wine competition I ever judged was the Royal Easter Show Wine Awards in 1994. And uh, I was on the panel that gave the Villa Maria Reserve Noble, Noble Riesling the, uh, the trophy uh, for top sweet wine and, and trophy wine for the wine of the show um, back then. And, um, uh, and, and of course, back then the uh, legal drinking age was 20. Um, and I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite old enough to drink at the time, but, uh, but, <laughs> but I didn't tell anyone cause I wanted to taste those, the, you know, a couple of 300 wines or so. Um, but, um, you know, way, way back then Villa Maria was, was, was constantly the, uh, the, the, the champion wine of the show trophy and, and remains so. Um, yeah. And I see uh, here we have this lovely picture of, of Sir George uh, Fistnich um, and his daughter Karen uh, sitting on the um, arm of the couch uh, with Lady Gale, uh, his wife, uh, sitting sitting down on the on the couch there. Yes. <laughs> Shall I tell you a little bit about um, George and the fa and you know what it was like working for him, Matt? Yeah, that's an experience that um, a lot of people um, have enjoyed. Um, basically, um, as Matt said, that's George with his uh, wife and his daughter. Um, basically, um, George has three children. Basically, what a stupid way of putting it. George has three children, um, and Karen is the most active in the company. She's very active. She's on the board, etc. He has um, six grandchildren, and they are actually several of them are working in the in the company and viticultural, etc. So um, he's been married for a long time. I'm thinking he's been married for about nearly sixty years. So um, he's had a very supportive wife all this time. Um, so when you say, oh, what's it been like working for George? I think I, I think I clicked, I was, I was onto something different when I went for the interview. I could tell then he was a little bit different. I'd never been um, interviewed by somebody who really wasn't that interested in what, what, what qualifications I had. It was actually, he was trying to test out whether I had the drive and passion to work. I didn't know anything about wine then. And I, um, I that, so the questions were unusual. He would often ask about family, things that you obviously can't ask now. He'd ask, ask me, um, you know, what sort of animals I liked, all these sorts of things. And I found it quite unusual, but that's how I worked out how he decided to make a sort out whether he felt you could fit into the, um, into the scheme of things. It was a very, um, Back then, you've got to remember, it was in 1984, there was only probably 30 staff. It was just the winery in Auckland and one in Hawke's Bay. And it was, there was only three, 30 of us. Now there's 300. So it was a much bigger company. But the things I recall most about George, well, I still work with him, obviously. But the things I recall most in those days, he loved a good debate. Any, anybody that agreed with him all the time, that was no good. He liked you. We had to thrash things out, talk about things. He was very passionate about training. He had intuition about the market. He would, his, the business was his life. You could be caught there talking to him and coming up with ideas all night. He was talking, always talking about um, how he can make things better. He was always coaching the winemakers, wanting us to give them feedback, etc. cetera. Um, he had incredible intuition and he always could see, um, he would see trends coming from overseas, et cetera. Um, and I think a great example um, of, of what, what he achieved was, um, in the big, the night about 2000, we were finally tired of um, the corks that we were receiving from Portugal. Um, we were finding that in a box of six wines, we, um, we'd get one that would have cork taint. So we had to think about shifting to the new closures, which we have on the bottles now, the Stelvin closures. So um, <clears throat> we were very worried because prior to that, uh, or well, the wine that had a screw cap was cheap wine. It was European wine. It was often very cheap and just quaffing wine. So we were worried about how we were going to present this and whether the consumer would actually enjoy um, the experience of switching from a cork, which has a romance about it, pulling the cork out, 
Um, so he thought and thought about it for a long time. And um, so he came up, he, he came up and he said, I know what I'm going to do. He said, we had three ranges at the time. We had a, a um, lovely private bin, the more sort of approachable wine. We had the cellar selection that we've got tonight. And then we had the reserve wine. And he said, I'm going to start by putting it on our most expensive wine. So the wines that were selling for 20 or $30. And we're like, what? what? What are you thinking about? Why would you start at that end? And he explained to us that the people that purchased the, the uh, more expensive wines were more engaged with wine. They understood what cork tape was. They understood that by having these new closures, they wouldn't have the problems they'd had. And um, so over three years, we, we transferred all our closures to Crew Gap. And it was totally accepted because the people who bought the private bin, the quaffing, the more sort of every, their everyday wine, they were probably hanging out waiting for when are they going to get the screw cap. So it was one of those things. And because it was so successful by doing it that way, when we went into our export markets, we did the same thing. So it was something that a lot of people wouldn't have thought of and a lot of other companies did it the other way around. So, and, it, and they weren't so successful. We don't believe they were anyway. It's, it's kind of a remarkable story that he's now, the, it's the largest family owned winery in New Zealand and what he's achieved. And what was very exciting for us all, especially long term employees like mine, um, and he was in 2009, um, you could say the Queen offered him a knighthood, but really of course it comes from, the, um, from New Zealand. Helen Clark was the prime minister at the time. Um, when he got given the Order of New Zealand. And then when John Key came in, he was, get, he was able to get um, it transferred into a knighthood. So that was a real thrill for us um, that we had the first sir in the wine industry in New Zealand. And he still is the only sir. I'm sure there's going to be such a wonderful industry. I'm sure there's going to be many more, but it was, it was, it was just fantastic. And we were so, we're so incredibly um, excited for him. And actually we all felt it was so, so deserved. So my memories of all those years of working, there was hard work, hard, hard work, but lots of fun, lots of giving back. He always thought, thought a woman was just as capable of achieving as, as a man. He was very fair. We had an amazing uh, woman winemaker, chief winemaker for many years. She's fantastic. So he was very fair. And um, yeah, no, no regrets for these years I've spent working there. How's that? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a lovely story, isn't it? And and I'm not sure who who would um, it, you know who next would earn a, earn a knighthood in the New Zealand wine industry because you know Villa Maria and and Sir George are you know are the last man standing when you think of of you know most of the most of the um, you know so many of of the wine companies in New Zealand are are foreign owned or um, by the Americans oh, and, the, and the French and that sort of thing, yeah, um, yeah. and it, and it's a it's it's a lovely juncture at this stage to let everyone know that we're gonna um, we're gonna ha have a little quiz and um, a little multi choice quiz. Um, I always I always chose C when I when I ever I did multi choice and <laughs> and you were right at least a third of the time. So, uh, <laughs> but um, exactly. But we, <laughs> But we're going to do uh, question one. Uh, what year was Villa Maria founded? Um, and and you know, interesting story with the with the screw caps, isn't it? Because it's amazing to think that that was twenty years ago, nearly. Um, mm. And I I remember I was a um, consultant to some restaurants in in Auckland, and you know, talking to the sommeliers, they were very skeptical about these these strange uh, screw caps. Um, and the the new season Sauvignon Blancs came out in in September, and um, they they sort of reluctantly took on those those Villa Maria Reserve um, Sauvignon Blancs with the with the screw cap. But by the time that um, that the Christmas rush was over, they were raving about them because it was <laughs> it was so easy to to you know take take them off, and then so easy to put them on, and then you could put them back in the fridge um, sideways and there was no leaking and, and things so they, they really are a, and, they, and they're a perfect um, perfect feel for the style of wine that New Zealand produces you know all that sort of vivacious um, you know aromatic and fruity aromatic intensity um, really um, you know just just stays you know very beautifully preserved under that screw cap doesn't it 
Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, I always think when you see some... Tell us a no, bit about it... this photo, because uh, oh, there's yes, the actually... and Sir George. <laughs> I'm actually quite keen to get it off. I'm sure everyone's done it. You know, I'm looking at all my wrinkles, etc. Anyway, that was, I just popped that in, Matt, because it was kind of special. Um, I'd been living in the UK for three years, and last year, George came over, and um, we were celebrating our distributor in, in England, um, Hatch Mansfield, and they've been, it's their first big export market, and they've been looking after us for, well, it's nearly 30 years, but the company then became uh, Hatch Mansfield, so 25-year anniversary for them. And in the UK, Villa Marie is just such a love brand. It's some such a, they, they how can I put it? They, we're now the mo one of the most, you know, um, the most recognised and uh, valued New Zealand wine companies in the UK. So I just popped that in. So you can move on to the next slide now. <laughs> it's been on for a while. Okay, so um, I just wanted to tell you briefly before we go into the tasting tonight about the, the range of wines that Villa Maria makes. So tonight, um, Michelle might get out her little, um, her little, she's got a little pointer that she's going to put on these wines. But the first wine is the Private Bin wine. These are fabulous wines. They're very good value. They're a white label. They tend to be um, perfect wine just to pick up. You know, you'll, you'll see these wines everywhere. They're reasonable price. They're, they, they are very consistent. There's, it's a huge range. There's red wines, there's Pinot Noir, there's Cabernet, there's the full range of white wines, etc. So that's, that's really our, our day to day brand. And the Sauvignon Blanc in that is just all over the world. It's the one wine that people recognize. It's a, an internationally known label. The next wine we have is the Cellar Selection, which is what we're drinking tonight. This, is, um, this wine is, um, has, has a lot more flavor. There's not so much of it made. It has more, the vineyards that the fruits come from are of, of a higher quality. So it's kind of in between the white and the black label. So it's a little bit more of a special occasion. If you get used to drinking the white label and you move up to this, you'll notice the difference and you'll see how beautiful these wines are tonight. They're often um, quite food friendly. Again, there's a full range of these wines. Then we move up to the cell, uh, reserve wine, the black label. And this is the one that um, Matt was talking about, the sommeliers. Um, serving in the restaurants, etc. This is quite getting up to a little bit more like special occasion. Again, a full range. This comes from our very finest vineyards. So if you travel in a, in a truck around Marlborough with the people that look after our vineyards, the viticulturalists, they would be able to say to you, oh, Angela, look over there, that's a reserve vineyard. They already know which vineyards are producing the best possible fruit. They're the most well-managed vineyards and the fruit's amazing. So those wines, would, those vineyards would be going into the reserve. And then finally, you have the single vineyard. Again, black label. But the difference there is that that wine is in much smaller volumes, and it just comes from one vineyard. So it doesn't have several um, blended together. It's, it's often quite a little bit niche, a little bit quirky, a little bit different. And it really picks up all the flavors that are coming from that, just from that one vineyard. So People often get a favourite, you know, and under the single vineyards, you've got them coming from about four different vineyards, and they might say, oh, I just love the Taylor's Pass, or I just love the such and such. Finally, we have our Narkiri Kiri. We should all have a competition trying to say that. Um, Narkiri Kiri means the gravels, which is um, a, a vineyard in Hawke's Bay. Very stony, so that's why it's the Maori name for the gravels. It is an icon wine, it's a flagship, and it's only made in years that we have just the best weather, where the grapes are just perfect, where everything is aligned, and we've done lots of thankfulness that we've got this amazing wine. It has, it gets the very best French barrels to be, to be aged in, et cetera, et cetera. It's expensive, it's a special occasion, it comes in a beautiful box, and it is a wine to put down. So it's a wine that you'd put in your cellar. So it's, it's, it's the top of the pops. I'm pretty sure you can get it in Singapore. Um, am I right, Michelle? She'll tell us later on the quick Q&A. So that's the, our range of wines. And tonight we're going to be tasting the Cellar Selection um, Sauvignon Blanc. So I think it's time for us to really get into this. I'm getting a bit thirsty. And um, we're just going to quickly talk about Marlborough. Um, Matt, I, you and I chatted about this, that you never went to Marlborough before the grapes there, did you? You were too young. 
No, I, I, I went to Marlborough in the 90s and there were certainly a lot less grapes than there are now. You know, when you fly in today, um, it's, it's just a swathe of grapes, isn't it? It's, it's so spectacular. Yeah. <coughs> so but, just um, a wee, yeah. <coughs> yeah, wee quick story on Marlborough. So I grew up right down the bottom in Southland and we, I came from a farm which was always green. We had big fat sheep and wool and lots of green grass. And I used to go and see my sister in Marlborough. She married a guy from Marlborough. And I couldn't believe it the first time I went there. Um, it was like dusty. The paddocks are all stony. The sheep are all kind of like skinny. Um, and, you know, the farmers are looking pretty depressed um, because they, it was such tough farming. There was often droughts, especially this is on the, in the, on the flat land in Marlborough. And um, they really were, there was sort of kind of a word we used, hard up was a word we used in New Zealand about when somebody wasn't doing very well and they're often getting drought, drought relief. But if only they'd known what was around the corner, basically, um, and of many have lived, have, you know, lived to tell this tale. But in 1979, so we're talking 40 years ago. Um, yep, that's right, 40 years ago. We, um, a Croatian again, actually, sort of a relation of George's, he decided that he felt Marlborough was the place where you could um, make the Sauvignon Blanc and they've been doing tests. So he put the first commercial vineyard in. And this is going to sound like it's come out of a Bible, but he, he harvested his wine, he drank the wine, and he said, <clears throat> one day this wine will be famous all over the world. And there's a plaque in Marlborough. And boy, was the never a true word said. So it's just been an incredible thing, Marlborough, for us. And there's basically, from that day on, once the world found out about it, there was a land grab in, in a lot of ways. People, the land just went up, up, up in price. And if you go to Marlborough now, it's just the most greenest, incredible place. There's hardly a nook or a cranny that hasn't got a vine in it. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a good one to talk about. And Matt is going to talk about that and the, and the wine right now. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I remember I was a, in, involved with um, a magazine in New Zealand called Cuisine Magazine that every year... Um, or, or every every month or so, used to uh, taste all of the current vintages of of all the main varieties. And I remember way back when uh, the 1991 Villa Maria Private Bin uh, Sauvignon Blanc being in the in the top three uh, Sauvignon Blancs in New Zealand um, back in in 1992. And wow. um, so you know, incredible thing way back then that Villa Maria. Um, was uh, was producing uh, one of the one of the best Sauvignon blocks in in New Zealand, and it was the private bin. It wasn't even the reserve. Today um, we're going to taste and and please taste along with us the Villa Maria Cellar Selection Sauvignon Blanc. And I remember when Cellar Selection first came out. Um, a, a friend of mine, Kim Milne, was the uh, and and fellow uh, fellow master of wine. Uh, Kim Milne was the winemaker for Villa Maria um, back then and there were parcel there, there were barrels of, of Chardonnay and, and and Merlot and Cabernet um, that just weren't quite up to the standard of reserve, um, just a notch below. And he had very, very exacting standards as, as we do today for the reserved here. Um, but it seemed just such a shame uh, for them to uh, go into the private bin range. So he he begged George to let him have a, a, a middle a, a middle range between reserve and private bin. Um, and and still today, they're they're probably the um, the best value wines in New Zealand. They're a bit of an insider's secret um, because not everyone really knows about them. Um, a lot of people know about private bin, and a lot of people know about reserve, but cellar selection is this kind of insider secret. And sure enough, uh, Michael Cooper, who's who's one of our uh, leading wine critics in New Zealand, um, of all the thousands of wines that he, he tastes um, and the thousands of white wines that he tastes, he rated this, this particular 2019 cellar selection Sauvignon Blanc as the best value um, white wine in New Zealand. Yep. Um, yeah. So really incredible. Um, uh, I'm getting a bit 
bit bit dizzy with the uh, with the PowerPoint, but we're we're still talking about the uh, the Villa Maria seller selections heavy and block. Um, so ignore the fact that it, it's that the PowerPoint says it's been in a um, But uh, so th this is a very pure expression of of Marlborough. Um, you know, Marlborough, of course, uh, being uh, at the top of the South Island, so heavily influenced by um, Antarctica in terms of its ocean ocean currents and um, and airflow, and therefore very cool. However. Um, because there are a lot of mountain ranges um, between the west coast uh, where the weather comes in from and in Marlborough itself, um, those mountain ranges, the, the clouds tend to congregate on the mountain ranges and the mountain ranges basically eat up uh, the clouds as they get to Marlborough. Um, and by the time you get to Marlborough, it's, it's all blue skies, you know, just incredible um, bright sunny days. Then, um, uh, because of uh, our proximity to Antarctica and because of the purity of the air, we have um, incredible UV concentration, uh, intensity of UV. So the grapes are getting a lot of um, a lot of UV intensity on them, which is converting the flavours in the grapes. So that's why the Marlborough style of Sauvignon Blanc has so much of that, you know pronounced um, beautiful passion fruit, grapefruit, uh, lemon, lime, um, fresh herb, um, you know, mango, guava, uh, flavor, uh, aroma. But the, um, but the nights are very cold in, in Marlborough. Um, so the temperatures drop down. Um, it gets very, 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 very chilly. You gotta have your hot blanket on at night. <laughs> and um, and then uh, and and so that preserves the acidity and preserves those fresh fruit flavors. So when you smell this wine, and and this is really just archetypal Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, um, you know, blend of of both valleys, Wairau and Awateri valleys. Um, Awateri tending to give you more of the the kind of citrus, um, kind of salty. Um, and, and sort of very tangy acidity, and then Wairau giving you more of the, the passion fruit, grapefruit, um, and, and kind of more fruit sweetness on the palate. Beautiful combination of those two, and, and just a, a really amazing selection of, of the best um, Sauvignon Blanc parcels. We were just the, <laughs> talking the other day, Matt, about what we think this wine, you know, we're thinking about what people, food people eat in Singapore and that this chili crab is, a, is one of their specialities and how a wine like this it's so fresh and will stand up to that uh, to, to, uh, to, to food like that and how in a hot climate the Sauvignon Blanc is really really popular um, because it's so fresh and the you know the crispness and the acidity when you when it's hot it's exactly sort of wine you can you can enjoy because it's a wine that you can chill so it's really quite cold um, I'm not going to say freezing, but you know what I mean? And you still get the flavours and the aromas still come out. Uh, I've had, had the experience that in France, the um, people down at, who supply the super yachts in France, they, they actually ask for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because that's what the people want. Because when you're out on a boat, it's just the perfect wine. So it obviously suits um, climates like your own in Singapore. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, hot climate, seafood, um, you know, all, all of those things. It's just, it's just such a, um, it, it is, it is sunshine in a glass, isn't it? It's happiness in a glass, really. Absolutely. Now, Matt, we were going to just quickly, before we move on to the Pinot Noir, we're just going to quickly talk about this year's vintage, which just has just been harvested. And the fact that, um, yeah, it was a bit different, wasn't it? With the situation. So perhaps you can tell everyone about what happened. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was it was a uh, it was an interesting vintage to work. Um, so Angela was talking about bubbles at the at the beginning, um, not the not the champagne bubbles, but the uh, <laughs> the, the the lockdown bubbles. And uh, this was this was the, uh, the the sort of tales of the lockdown harvest. Um, so we hired over a hundred. Uh, motorhomes um, and brought them into the 
into the wineries. So we have a winery in Marlborough and a winery in Hawke's Bay. And our, um, our harvest teams lived in, the, uh, in these motorhomes. And we created this little sort of village atmosphere. It was amazing. Um, and our our winery chefs um, also lived on the in in this little winery bubble and um, cooked them restaurant restaurant uh, quality meals every night. And there was incredible camaraderie. But um, but also everyone was very conscious about keeping the the two meter spacing from each other and. Um, so it was it was it was, uh, it was an unusual harvest, um, mm. but uh, but um, God tends to give us um, leaves us with incredible harvests when um, when there are sort of adverse human conditions, and uh, the quality of the harvest was incredible um, for all of our grape varieties and and all of our regions. Um, so um, anyone who was in New Zealand or have has friends who are in New Zealand over the summer, it was um, it was just a remarkable Kiwi summer, um, just day after day of of warm sunny weather. Yeah, it was uh, And uh, the 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 sort of the grapes came in with incredible concentration and flavours, and and the wines from twenty twenty are going to be remarkable. Absolutely. So we've got our next wine now. We're um, about to go on to the Pinot Noir. So if you've got two glasses, um, you may not want to open all your wine tonight. It's up to you, but um, it'll be fun if you did. Um, so Matt, um, you're going to talk us through the Pinot Noir, which is probably our second biggest wine from New Zealand. Um, it's very exciting that we have now really cracked the Pinot Noir market. So um, Matt will tell you all about that. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and I didn't have two glasses, so I drank the rest of my Sauvignon Blanc, which I enjoyed. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, now I do have the, have the Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noir is an exciting variety for, for New Zealand because New Zealand is a true cool climate. Mm. And, um, and Pinot Noir is a cool climate variety, but a lot of countries who, who grow it, you know, I came, I've, I've been living in in Napa Valley for the last um, several years, and um, and the Cal and California is is just simply too warm uh, for for Pinot Noir, um, and it produces a, a very different style of Pinot Noir. But um, you come to you know it's it's been so lovely coming to New Zealand and drinking Pinot Noirs that really taste of Pinot Noir, you know, because Pinot Noir um, like this wine, like the cellar selection. Pinot Noir, um, which is you know very classic of of what what Pinot Noir should be, it's very charming. It has this kind of beguiling, aromatic, um, you know, sort of floral, red fruit, and dark fruit, mm. um, with some sort of savory, you know, lovely savory earthy aromas, and and um, and a little bit of the kind of dried herb flavors, and then. Um, and this is very typical of Marlborough Pinot Noir, and, and New Zealand itself produces quite, you know, some quite different styles of Pinot Noir depending on the region. Um, so Centro Otago um, produces a, a, a much sort of darker, dark fruited, kind of full bodied, um, but those, that, that sort of extreme climate, you're getting sort of racy acidity and um, quite a lot of tannin uh, and, and quite a lot of body. In, in New Zealand, the, uh, sorry, in Marlborough, the um, Pinots are a lot more supple and they're, they're more of the silky, seductive style of Pinot Noir. So on the palate, you're gonna get a, a, a very um, kind of uh, sweet fruited, fleshy um, style with, with that lovely um, mouth-watering Marlborough acidity. And then, um, and then that, you know, lovely silky finish. Mm. We were, we and, were talking. Um, yeah, and for, for and again, you know, just a, a lovely wine with um, the style of cuisine that at least you know that we at least imagine that you guys eat. Um, you know, like with the uh, with the chili. Yeah, you know, I guess we imagine you guys all sort of out there eating this amazing um, street food and, and, you know, having these incredible sort of long brunches and things. 
um, and we're all we're all very jealous of of this sort of expat lifestyle um, in some ways. Although we're you know I, uh, having come back from the US, I'm very very happy to be living in in New Zealand right now. But um, but yeah, we do imagine the the sort of chili crabs and things with the with the um, Sauvignon Blanc and and with this Pinot Noir. Um, you know the the, uh, the the sort of um, soy sauce, chicken rice, and and that sort of you know you, you can you can eat food um, you can have this pinot noir with food with with a lot of umami a lot of that sort of deliciousness um, that a lot of the wonderful Singaporean cuisine has. Yeah, and we were talking Matt the other day the fact that you know a wine like this can be chilled slightly, especially in a hot climate, but it just you know it can actually handle that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I got into the habit of, of chilling all of my reds um, back in back in Napa for sure, um, and and that was partially because the climate was quite hot as it is in Singapore, and partially because the alcohol levels in Napa are so high, and it sort of knocks down the alcohol a little bit. But um, you know, for for the New Zealand reds in in Singapore, absolutely, you're going to um, retain that that lovely sort of fresh crispness um, that this wine has um, and uh, you'll, you'll find that they warm up pretty quickly in the in the climate um, although I'm sure um, you're nicely nicely air conditioned most of the time but um, the, uh, the the other thing is um, you know because my wife uh, doesn't drink wine I tend to um, the, the, the sort of onus of the, the burden of drinking wine uh, um, it lies purely on my shoulders, and so um, I'll tend to drink, you know, half a bottle um, one night, and then because I'm uh, a bit of a wine geek, I, I don't like to have the same wine two nights in a row. So I'll put I'll put the other half in the fridge, and um, I can go back to it in in five days' time. So I have this kind of weird rotation of of wines in the fridge, um, and the the Keeping them in the fridge does slow the slow the uh, degradation down a lot. So in, in five days' time, red wine pulled out of the fridge warms up fairly quickly, and it's absolutely delicious. It's still fresh. Perfect. Um, the just looking at these lovely grapes, um, I'm always reminded with Pinot Noir. The first thing I learned about it was that it likes a cold night. It's Quiet like Marlborough, um, and I think the thing is reminded that it's quite a thin skin grape, isn't it? And it 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 actually is a little bit. We always talk about what thin skin people are like. You have to be, you know, they're sensitive. You have to be careful with them. Well, the Pinot Noir is a little bit precious, isn't it? It has to. It doesn't want to be hot at night because it hasn't got the thick, thick skin, and that's also why it's lighter in colour than other reds. So people often, when if they don't know Pinot Noir, when you first pour it, they go, ooh but it really relates back to um, the colour coming from the skin. It's French. It's thin-skinned and sensitive, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Sexy as well, maybe. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not really a wine geek, Matt. I just thought I'd tell you that. Um, anyway, I think that um, they are two fantastic wines. And um, we talked about this year's vintage being crazy, having all the camper vans. Well, last year's was a little bit crazy too. Um, we made a movie. So I'll let Matt tell you about that as well. Yeah, lovely. Um, and, and I am actually a closet wine geek. So I, lo I love this vintage uh, movie. Um, and, but I think, every, I think anyone would, anyone who's vaguely interested in wine, because um, it, it's the fly on, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have fantasized about what is it actually like during during harvest. Um, and uh, this is the true fly on the wall, um, following the winemakers around um, during a true harvest season. Um, and and really incredible. You you just you know it just oozes the passion of of our our viticulturists and our winemakers. Um, and it certainly make made me um, very thirsty during the whole thing. Um, a little bit exhausted, <laughs> <laughs> just watching it. Um, and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, just an amazing glimpse into, into the world of that, that sort of, you know, balance of art and science and, and blood, sweat, tears and passion, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And I know Rachel said that you're going to get a copy of this presentation so you'll be able to look up and see where you can, where you can view the movie. Okay, so we're, um, we're just really getting on to our questions, Matt. So this is the moment of truth to see who's been listening. All right. So, um, so let's reveal the answers and maybe, uh, maybe you can answer them for us, Angela. <laughs> So what year was Villa Maria founded? You were there, weren't you? No, I, I was actually born, but no, I was probably still at kindy or something. But yeah, 1961. Mm. Looks like 88% uh, of people were right. So that's pretty cool. That's great. I'm impressed. And, yep. and speaking of cool, um, what is the main <laughs> character of the climate that contributes to crisp, fresh flavours of Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc? And it is indeed high sunshine and cool nights. Um, mm. And 75% of you are right. So, um, assuming that uh, everyone who got high sunshine and cool nights right also got 1961 right, then 75% uh, of you will go into the draw to win uh, the Villa Maria Reserve Wairau Valley Sauvignon Blanc, which um, is incidentally. Uh, in Robert Parker's Wine Advocate, which is the, the global wine bible, um, the highest scoring Sauvignon Blanc from 2019 vintage. So, um, you know, true true greatness in a bottle. And Congratulations to everyone. I've got some great news for everyone attending tonight in that we've just realised the poll is anonymous. So we'll put everyone who's attended tonight into the draw to win that one. Oh. <laughs> How so, yeah. that well, is. That's the joys, joys. But um, that's, yeah. that's the, no, so that's everyone, millennial everyone society, goes, isn't it? It's uh, <laughs> you know participation trophies for everyone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got up on the screen now all the ways you can keep in touch with us. Um, I would like you to um, it'd be lovely if you can follow us on Instagram. That's my that's my uh, favourite uh, social media. I love the pictures. Um, but I also now really want to thank um, you for put, letting me have my first Zoom tasting or uh, discussion. So that's got that out of the way. That's quite good to get tick that box. I want to thank the Chamber in um, Singapore for liaising with us. I've seen the emails going backwards and forwards. There's been a lot of work's gone into this. And I think the fact that there's 50 plus people here tonight, I think that's amazing. I want to thank Wine and Spirits Online for organising the wine that the people that people purchase. The majority of you purchased the two bottles. That's so exciting that we're actually you're actually getting really involved. Um, and yeah, that's kind of basically it. I hope I haven't kind of let anyone out, but Monica and um, Rachel have been fantastic. And um, we know there are some questions. So um, I would like, um, Rachel's now going to be um, organizing the questions. Um, the other thing that I thought I should show you that years ago, no, only about six years ago, there was a book, book written about George. So that's, you might want to look at, it's a fantastic read. Yep. <laughs> so are you, are it was just, are you in there, Ange? I am, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think we should thank you, Ange, for uh, sharing 36 years of, of Villa Maria um, with all of oh, us. I know. And, yeah, and your first virtual tasting in 36 years of, of yeah. Villa Maria. So it's, it's I know, incredible, yeah. isn't it? This is yeah. a, a it's, global it's, it's been, first. I know. It's been quite exciting because I was really, really nervous. And my son, I've locked him in the front room. He's saying, you'll be all right, Mum. You'll be all right. So anyway. I can, we can move on now. So Rachel, we'd love to hear the questions. Matt will probably answer most of these. Well, yeah, I guess this is a bit of a chance for everyone at home to ask us a question. We've, oh, hang on, we've got one here. We've got the three oh. that are saying how fabulous the wine is and how much they've enjoyed it. So not actually questions, but, um, but thank you. Um, yes. And then we've got one here about, do you, have, do you have any Villa Maria wine tasting tours? in New Zealand, obviously someone planning a trip in the future that, that would like to mm. be involved. Yeah, so we, we will actually, and, and this is something I'm deeply involved with at the moment. Um, so right now, of course, because of um, uh, the, the New Zealand lockdown laws, um, all, of our, uh, all, all of our tasting rooms are closed. Um, so we're so it's given us an opportunity to to take a breather and say, hey, what 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 should our tasting rooms look like um, when we do reopen them? 
we're looking to reopen them in October. And um, absolutely, we're, we're ideating lots of really cool ideas for, um, for, for, to, for Villa Maria experiences, things like, um, you know, vertical tastings with winemakers and, and the opportunity to, to walk around the vineyard and look at our, you know, we have incredible um, organic and sustainability programs that you can actually see through the vineyard. Um, you know, we're growing, we're, we're growing these uh, native um, plants under the rose that, um, that, that, that actually um, prevent the weeds from growing under the rose so we don't have to use undervine herbicides and things. Um, we have amazing worm farms and things. So, you, you, you know, you'd go and look at all of these things and then go back and have a tasting of all our organic wines. Um, so we're, we're just planning all these. Uh, the sad news, I, I believe, for everyone in Singapore is that um, we're not going to let any international visitors into New Zealand until there is a COVID vaccine circulated. So that's pro we're probably looking 12 to 18 months away. Um, but uh, as soon as we can, we look forward to welcoming all of you at the winery um, we, uh, the, the, as soon as you can get here. And I think, I think for Kiwis living in Singapore, we're okay to come back, but at the moment we'd have to quarantine. Oh, yes. that's the two yes, weeks. that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, was, I was going to say too, the Auckland Winery, which is amazing, most beautiful landscaped area, is so close to the airport, you know, so um, if you had to, qu yeah, no, you can't get out and come from a quarantining, but you know what I mean. I'm just thinking about, um, it's a great location if you don't get to go down the country to come to the, visit the winery near the Auckland airport. None of us would recommend that you sneak out the hotel window and come and visit Villa Maria. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but if you do, um, we would welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> We've just got another question here around how many varietals, how many different varietals does Villa Maria make at the moment? Um, and have there been any that were a trial that have actually turned into an ongoing release? So a bit of a double question there. Yeah, great question. Um, the Ooh. answer is a lot. It's in the... I want to say, because it fluctuates a little bit, high 20s, let's say 28 uh, different varieties. Um, the one that we're really excited about right now, um, that was a trial that is doing extremely well and we're finding more and more is Albarino from the northwest of Spain. Um, and it's a variety that, um, you know that, that that has that wonderful aromatic um, character. Has those you know lovely um, sort of lemony, floral, peachy flavors. Um, and uh, you know the the New Zealand style of of Albarino is um, is I think is as exciting to the Albarino grape as as the New Zealand style of Sauvignon Blanc is to the Sauvignon Blanc grape. Absolutely. Fabulous. Cool. We've got, we've got another question here um, around George's book and how much it costs and is it available in Singapore? I guess it's on it's on book depository and those kind of... It might be on Amazon. I tell you, uh, Rachel, I can find out for you. Yeah, I can find out for you what um, where it is um, because there's hard copies and, and so, you know, non... What do you call that? Yeah, paperback. And we we may be able well. to send some up to New Zealand Chamber yeah. for... For anyone okay. who's we can make them available because we've still got we've still got we've had, it's had two it's it's sold in bookshops initially but it's we've had two runs of it so it's um it's and it's it is really interesting Popular. it's basically yeah it's been really good love it's a lovely book lovely photographs etc. Cool and I think the last question we've got here is around um where can we. Where can we stay? This must be the same person who wanted to come and do a tour at Villa Maria. Where can we stay for a day to do a wine and food tasting? And I guess, again, that, that depends on borders and things opening up. But is there accommodation at the vineyard? Not, not at the, no, not none of the, our vineyard. Not at the Auckland winery, no. Um, uh, so, I mean, there, there are hotels nearby. Um, you know, if I was coming in even for a day, to stay in Auckland, I would stay at the viaduct or somewhere. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily stay by the airport, um, but some people do, don't they? They stay at that Novotel Absolutely. at the airport and, and things. Um, 
But um, yeah, I mean, Villa Maria is interesting. You know, the, our, our Auckland winery is interesting because you know, out by the airport's really industrial, and then you sort of go through these gates, and you're into you enter another world, and it's actually the mm. crater of a volcano, um, and it's quite it's this you know beautiful you know um, park like grounds um, surrounded by trees, so you don't you you, you suddenly enter another world, um, and you just drive through. Um, you know, acres and acres of, of vineyard and, and there's little pukekos running around, the little um, little kind of bluey purple birds. Um, and then you drive up to the, to the, to the winery and, and uh, come and have your experience. So it, it really is special. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. There's a really, uh, on the New Zealand Wine Growers website, there's a, um, a link where it says uh, visit. So you go to New Zealand Wine Growers or just New Zealand Wine, you Google that and you go to visit and it's a fabulous resource. It's got every, it's all up to date, every winery in New Zealand and what, what you can do at that, at those wineries, the hours, etc. Obviously through um, what we've gone through now, things will have changed, but it's a good place to start because it's um, being online, it's up to date all the time and you can look at every right. winery in New Zealand. And we've got, we've got another question here um, about the 2020 vintage. So it seems that, that 2020 is going to be a great year. Can we expect some na kiri kiri for 2020? I, I, undoubtedly, yeah, yeah, there will be. Mm. Yeah, we, and, amazing. And, and 2019 actually um, was, was an exceptional Hawke's Bay uh, red vintage. So th there will be a 2019 na kiri kiri. Um, we're about to release the 2014. Cool. And a, a couple of um, more technical questions. What oak do you use for most of your barrel ferments if they're not in steel? And second part of the question, do you do any wild ferments? Yeah, yeah. So really we're talking mostly Chardonnays here um, for barrel ferment. And we do a lot of wild ferment in barrel. Uh, for Chardonnays, and um, it's all French. We we exclusively um, work with uh, French barrels for our Chardonnays. Okay. And last one here. What's the ideal storage temperature for a Sauvignon Blanc? And I think living in Singapore this is a very important thing to know. Um, where should we be storing our wine? In the fridge. Yep. So uh, if if you don't have um, a, a fridge big enough for for your food and your wine, then get another fridge. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's it's been proven that uh, Sauvignon Blanc, the best place to store Sauvignon Blanc, um, and particularly because it's in screw caps. So the, the the reason why you might not store wine in the fridge is because it will because um, it can dry out the cork. Um, because it's a very low humidity environment, but uh, under screw cap, absolutely fine. Um, and you will you you will preserve the um, the aromatics of Sauvignon Blanc for longer. Um, so uh, at, at one of the um, Sauvignon Blanc um, events that they have in Marlborough um, a couple of years ago, they 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 had basically accidentally found this. Sort of twenty-year-old Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc that had been sitting in a fridge, um, and they tried it, and it was it was still incredibly young, um, and and so they they started doing trials and learned that um, uh, that that storing Sauvignon Blanc, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, in a fridge is the best storage environment. Okay, and if we want to get really specific, what temperature should the wine cooler be set to? That's that's a follow-up <laughs> question. Yeah, um, yeah. For, so I'm I'm talking about like food refrigeration temperature. Okay, so just your normal your normal fridge. It'll yeah. Be, it'll be so not even not a, so I'm not talking about your sort of wine fridge where you might have your your reds at 16 degrees and your whites at 13 or whatever. I'm I'm talking about actual food storage refrigerator temperature and 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 yeah. Mm. Excellent. Well, we've actually, we've come to the end of the questions. Um, so thanks, thanks both of you. Um, really on, on behalf of the New Zealand Chamber and, and everyone attending today, 
thanks for your time and for your expertise. I love that we've done our first virtual wine tasting together. Um, and I think you've both really helped bring that Villa Maria story to life. I can see the passion for the brand and, and the wines and the business um, and the way that both of you talk. Um, and it's been lovely to bring a little piece of New Zealand to Singapore as well. So um, I'd also like to thank everyone for attending and we will um, let you know who wins that bottle of wine in the drawer. And just a reminder for everyone that you can still buy your Villa Maria wine at winesandspirits.sg and use the chamber code until the end of May um, to, get your, to get your discount. So um, the code is NZCXCM um, for those who, who haven't seen it before. Um, thanks both Andrew and Matt. Thank you so much and um, have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Yep.